Thank you, Emily, um, and thank you to the PCA for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, so it says in the programme it's, it's um, about design of external drainage, but really part of that is the assessment of groundwater. Um, so, so I'll also talk about that. Um, and just to add to Ian, the most common thing in our, where I live is utility companies and builders digging through cables. <laughs> um, so if you, if you put in external drainage around the outside of the basement, really the design should begin with an assessment of what the groundwater conditions are. Um, and that is important for external drainage, but it's also important for other things as well. Um, it's obviously important for the waterproofing risk assessment that BS8102 tells you you need to do. Um, it's important for cavity drainage design um, if you want realistic ingress rates, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit of detail, um, and also risk of contamination, uh, contaminated water coming into the basement. Um, it's important for VOCs, volatile organic carbons or hydrocarbons as some people refer to them, um, because the groundwater levels will determine um, which approach you use to assess VOC ingress into the basement. So is it gas phase ingress or is it water dissolved phase ingress? And dissolved phase ingress is going to be a lot, lot faster than gas phase or vapour phase ingress. Uh, and then finally, it's important for the ground gas risk assessment if you're on a site where you've got methane, carbon dioxide or any other gas because if your basement is below groundwater level, um, then you shouldn't be using BS8485, uh, 8, 8, um, the GSV approach in there. That is intended for gas phase migration into buildings. It's not designed for assessing dissolved methane and dissolved carbon dioxide below the groundwater table. So a lot of what I'm talking about is, is quite important uh, for, for other reasons as well. Um, there are issues, yeah, it's great if, if we, if, you know, we need, we want, the aim is to get a really good hydrogeological assessment, we understand the groundwater regime, but there are things that get in the way of doing that, yeah, and the, the first one is, that is there sufficient site investigation data of an acceptable quality, and was it known at the time of the site investigation that a basement was going to be part of the development, or was it an unknown, and that's changed later? Uh, and does a site investigation contract to actually understand the implications of having a basement? And that's going to influence where they put the monitoring wells, for example. Um, and that, that often does limit the potential for a good assessment. So uh, what you do, you've got a lot of un data uncertainty there. And your way that you address that is by being cautious in the assessment. And that ends up with, um, I say over-design there. It's, over design is probably the wrong word. You, 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 you're allowing for you dealing with the uncertainty by putting more waterproofing protection in, in effect, um, which increases costs. Now, sometimes you've got to balance out the difficulty and the cost of doing the investigation with the extra cost of the waterproofing. So, you know, I do a load of work in gas, I think some of you probably know that. And quite often, people come to us and say, Can you reduce the gas protection? And we say, Well, yeah, we can, but it's, it's cheaper to put it in rather than pay us to do that or collect the extra data. So there's always that balancing act. Um, so you need to understand the basement construction as well um, and the geology because you really should be putting the monitoring wells in discrete horizons so that you understand what the different water levels are and what the different water tables are. What we unfortunately tend to see most of the time is people just whack a standpipe in from one metre to however far they've drilled the hole and then you just get a water column in there um, and that it, it, it tells you something, but it's not as useful as if you've got discrete wells in different horizons or different strata. Um, there's a saying, you pay for a site investigation whether you've had one or not. I would say you pay for a decent site investigation whether you've had a decent site investigation or not. And that's been around as long as I've been doing geotechnical engineering for 30 years. We still haven't addressed some of these problems. Um, so you can see that, that diagram on the, on the right-hand side there. Um, that's a, a project we looked at um, where there was a leak in the basement. And what had happened is they'd just put monitoring wells in. They'd not isolated the strata. Um, they'd looked at it. Um, and then they, they decided that there was a perched water table in the, in the made ground and possibly the head deposits. 
And then when they constructed it on site, there wasn't really any water. There's a little bit of water running initially into the excavation and they pumped it and then it stopped. So they made a reassessment on site and said, oh yeah, there's not a lot of water here. It's a lot lower risk than we thought it was and changed, um, reduced the design. And then what they'd not done, they'd not looked at a desk study of the surrounding area where it was clear that the basement was in a bowl, in a depression in the London clay. And then subsequently the water's just come back in and it's built up over time and, and then because of the defects it's leaked. Um, interpreting groundwater monitoring data, and uh, some of you might know, I, I am a geotechnical engineer, I'm a civil engineer, and I'm proud of that fact. And I think, you know, we've got to recognise that you need um, sort of people who understand the ground to understand groundwater properly. Um, and... Well, so it's not just a matter of putting a well in and saying, ah, oh, that's the highest water level in that well, therefore that is where the groundwater is. And this is just one example. So you can see here what's happened is we've put monitoring wells in this, this cohesive fill material, so it's a compacted clay. Um, and then you can see that there's been a gradual increase over time from when we started monitoring. The water level has gradually risen in the standpipes that we've installed. Um, and that's because it's measuring the pore pressure in the clay. So it's being compacted, you've got a pore pressure in there. And when you look at that, it comes up to where you'd expect the pore pressure be, to be in a compacted cohesive fill. But it's not a free water table. And then when you dig a big hole next to it, there is no water coming into that hole. So it's, it's more than just looking at, um, at, at, at water levels in pipes. You've got to understand the geology and groundwater. Um, so then we come to so, so we come to the drainage design, and, and I hear I see things written, hear things, um, lots of myths about external drainage. Yeah. So if it and, and there's a big caveat here, if it is designed correctly, yeah, it can have a long design life, the same as any other part of a waterproofing system. Yeah. Water flows into it can be assessed if you've got the data, so you've got the right site investigation information. And it can be designed to have an adequate capacity, including any pumps. Um, it won't cause washout of fines and soils around the basement, and it will not clog. Um, and it can be maintained um, to an extent. Um, certainly, the, um, sort of the pipe work can be maintained, but it needs inspection chambers. Uh, I mean, that's one of, the, one of the things you can't get away from. However, yeah, external drainage is usually impractical on many sites because there's no effective outfall available or because the basement construction method doesn't really allow you to do it. So, you know, if you've got, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? If you've got secant pile walls, uh, contig pile walls, whatever, you, you're not going to be digging down the outside of those um, in a deep basement in London to put external drainage in. Or certainly, somebody might have got alternative experience, but certainly not in my experience. Um, so outfalls, this, this is the big issue that I see. So we do a lot of work at uh, sustainable drainage design. And what I see in basement waterproofing external drainage is, is different to, the, to the, what we're seeing in suds and what we're allowed to do in suds design. So if you put an external drainage in, it has got to have an outfall, otherwise it will not work. And that's got to be either a water course or a circleware. Now, if you look at Surrey Sector Guidance Appendix C, a9, land drainage, it tells you that sewerage companies have no duty to accept uh, land drainage runoff flows from natural watercourses or groundwater. Yeah. Water companies, are, if you went and asked a water company if you could discharge groundwater into their sewerage system, you will get a categoric no in my experience. Yeah. They won't let us allow, you know, they have real issues about some of the groundwater ingress. We get into surface swales or into permeable pavements. Uh, so they're definitely not going to be allowing you to put groundwater in there. Um, so I think one of the things that I think is that the advice in BS8102, the, the latest version, on discharging external drainage to a stormwater, I don't think it's correct. Um, and then circleways, um, we need to, to look at those as well. Um, they need to be designed, yeah, and you need to design them so the water level is below the level of the basement. So a circleway, basically, the, the actual circleway chamber is a storage space for water. While it, so the rainwater runs into it quickly, 
or the groundwater runs into it quickly in this case, and then it soaks out slowly. Um, so you need to look at infiltration rates, particularly if you're putting it in a different place, because normally what you're doing, you're concentrating the groundwater that's flowing through quite a big area into a smaller area where it's going into a soak away. So you need to understand infiltration rates or permeability. And I think the same applies to cavity drains as well. Um, so, yeah, if, if you... And, and I think if you look at the um, PCA Type C guidance on, on inflow rates that you should assume for designing pumping stations, for example, then it gives you quite high flow rates. So if you do a proper groundwater assessment, potentially you can, you can reduce your pumping and you can reduce your pump costs. Um, but the other thing is, if you look at that, uh, that example on the right-hand side, actually, the, the, if you use those flow rates, the, the rate of water that we're pumping into sewers for, from these systems exceeds what the greenfield runoff rate is that we're allowed to pump in for a SUDS design. Uh, and we're pumping it into, if we are pumping it into sewers, particularly in urban areas, the biggest risk of flooding in a lot of urban areas is the, is the drainage system the old drainage system that is at capacity. So should we be adding extra groundwater into it and increasing flood risk is a question um, that, that we should be asking. I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, you can decide that. But it's certainly something we should, we should be thinking about. Um, and also, you know, though, because those systems are at or beyond capacity, they lock quite a lot. So you, you're probably going to find that your pump outfall um, could be locked uh, and in, in that example, again, you know, it, it's, it's going to fill that cavity drain in one or two hours. So there, where's your extra capacity? Now, you might have got a battery backup, but the pump can't pump because it can't get into the sewer. So lots of things to think about there. Um, external drainage design. Um, so effectively, what you do when you're designing the external drainage is essentially pretty similar to, to what we do if we design land drains, if we design, I've done a lot of work on highways in the past, so where you've got a cutting, quite often you put tow, tow drains in at the bottom of the cutting to keep groundwater under control, to maintain stability, for example, dewatering, um, if you're using just uh, gravity dewatering. There are lots of ways that we can analyze water flow into the drain, and, and the, you, know, you can do simple, very simple equations um, or you can do what used to be, well, they are known as flow nets, where you draw, draw diagrams of water flow through the, through the ground. Um, and these days, you, you can do it in, in modelling packages um, that we use for groundwater uh, assessment. So the, depending on the complexity of the project, it depends on how, how complicated you want to be. Um, and, and you can work out what the drawdown is, how much water is coming into the perforated pipe. Other things you need to think about on there, probably... Pretty, pretty small, sorry about that. Um, filter criteria for the, for the geotextiles around the pipes. So you need to make sure, basically the geotextiles work by allowing a filter cake to develop in the soil around it. So basically you do get a, a bit of loss of fines initially close to the, uh, close to the geotextile. But then effectively a filter structure, which is called a filter cake, builds up. And then it, the water flows through it and you don't get any more fines washing out. But you've got to make sure that it's going to work. Now, the, the common geotextiles that, that you use, um, the, the, the non-wovens, generally they're, they're, they're highly permeable. They've got sufficient permeability. They can, they can deal with a wide range of soils. So it's normally not a problem. But you do need to be aware that if you do get some unusual soils, um, like PFA, for example, pulverized fuel ash, if, you, if you're working with that. Uh, some windblown sands, which are called LOS, uh, things like that, odd gradings. You do, they, they can cause problems, and, the, and, and you won't get that filter cake developing, and it'll either um, clog or you, you will potentially lose fines. And the other thing is just smearing clay up um, against the, the geotextile. That is another issue as well. So... Yeah, it works most of the time, it's effective, but be aware of, of when it won't work. Um, and what else have we got there? Yeah, drainage backfill. Um, you actually need to put a surround, particularly if you've got a perforated plastic pipe. That relies on its strength from having a good surround. 
So basically, when you press down on a plastic pipe, it deflects sideways and it gets its strength from the soil at either side of it. So if you just whack it in there and chuck a bit of as dug around it, the likelihood is that if you shove a, t a CCTV camera down it, it's going to be oval or, or too oval. It will, it will overlies to a very small extent as it develops its strength normally. Um, but you need decent pipes around. So lots of things to think about in the design. Um, what else? Oh yeah, so it needs to be laid to falls uh, to, to make sure you've got the right capacity. Um, provide inspection chambers, as I said. And again, that's a big issue. So um, that can actually limit the, the practicalities of putting um, external drainage in. Um, said about geotextiles compatible with the soils. Um, so we've covered all that. And then, yeah, you can see there, make sure the circleway, the top design level of the circleway is below the level of the, uh, below the, level of the basement. Um, in terms of groundwater, we also need to think about external drains uh, and contamination. Um, because, again, coming back, even if you, are, even if you, you did get a water company to, to agree to discharge external, external drainage into a sewer, um, you need to think about if there are any contaminants in there that could cause an explosive atmosphere in the, in the sewer. Because, again, water companies will not allow you to discharge water into a sewer that's got anything that can potentially cause an explosive atmosphere. So, for example, if you've got gas monitoring on a site that says you've got 5% methane in the, in the gas monitoring well, and you've got groundwater in that well, it, it, will be, it potentially could be in equilibrium, and you could have dissolved methane that can cause an explosive atmosphere in a receiving sewer. So, you know, you need to think about it. Um, and um, that, that's actually explained in Syria C795, which is um, the uh, guidance document that Syria published on retrofitting gas protection measures um, in, into any buildings. And it, it came from some guidance that's in London, in one of the, uh, one of the local authorities. But the same thing, actually, uh, again, it comes back to is, is ground... I mean, one, does it apply to cavity drains? Um, certainly does the, the explosive atmosphere thing does because e even if the water company allows you to discharge the cavity to drain to the sewer you've got to comply with that requirement um, so, so when you apply for the permit you've got to look at whether, whether there is an issue there from contaminated groundwater um, and think about things like precipitation um, on external drainage so, for example, you know, we've seen pipes and geotextiles get clogged because people have used recycled aggregate, crushed concrete as the, as the bike fill. Um, and then you just get, you just get um, calcium, I uh, can't remember what it's called now, but it, it precipitates out onto the geotextile as it comes into the pipe. But you can also get iron, uh, if you've got iron-rich groundwater, that can cause problems as well. And then finally, um, basement waterproofing um, in contaminated sites. This is, again, it's, it, it's, it's VOC and hydrocarbon membranes. W what we're seeing is there is a perception, and it's not just in, in basement waterproofing, it, it's across the industry, and it, it is causing you know, some real problems that we see. VOC and hydrocarbon membranes do not completely stop migration into a building. They are, rel in real terms, even the, even the best ones um, are relatively permeable to, to hydrocarbon and vapour migration. And they can only work up to a point. So if, you, um, if you've got really high levels of contamination in a site, and particularly if it's a dissolved phase in groundwater in contact with a membrane, then there may well be a possibility that you need more than a VOC membrane to actually manage that risk. Thank you.